Hello, and thank you so much for attending our webinar on Welcoming Home Your New Dog. My name is Rachel Martirosian. I'm a certified professional dog trainer with Canine Turbo Training. I teach group classes as well as taking in-home cases, and I have a particular interest in building the relationship between dogs and people. Coincidentally, I'm currently integrating a new young dog into my own household, which at the moment includes another eight-year-old dog and an 11-year-old cat. Today, we're going to explore how you can best transition your new dog into your home. We'll cover how to set your new dog up for success. You'll get some tips for your first month together, uh, how to understand your dog's initial adjustment period and become a bit more fluent in reading your dog's body language, how to reduce stress during this transition. We'll talk about building this new relationship with your dog, as well as how to create positive relationships with children and current pets in the household, and I'll answer some common questions which come up when you're adding a new dog into your life. The first thing I want you to remember is that inviting a new dog into your home is an incredible opportunity for both of you to learn so many fun and exciting new things. This is just the start of your journey together. And by taking a little time to make a plan and navigate this opportunity in an intentional way, you can ensure that you're both prepared to enjoy all of the experiences which present themselves down the road. Your dog has just made a big transition. Whether they're coming from a shelter, a rescue, a friend, or a breeder, everything around them is brand new. They're going to need a little time to just get their bearings and readjust. So what is important for you to focus on right now? As soon as you bring your dog home, help them to relax in the spot that you would prefer for them to choose as a resting place in the future. You can bring them snacks or give them chew toys there. If they're looking for social contact, you can sit with them in that spot. It's just important to help them see that it makes sense to spend time in that location. Think about it. If you spend all of your time interacting with the dog and giving them new things on the couch, but you would prefer that they choose to rest on a dog bed, it's going to be very hard for them to understand why they should ever spend time on that dog bed. This is also your first real chance to get to know your new dog. You can begin to pinpoint the basics, like what foods or toys they prefer, and as you spend time together, you can start really learning about their personality. Starting out, you can concentrate on helping your dog get to know the core group of people they'll be living with. Again, transitions can be overwhelming, so it's best to start small. Lastly, work on helping your dog out with the basics. Start building an eating and potty routine so that you can add a little predictability to your new dog's life. A few guidelines you can keep in mind during this process include Choosing activities which put very little demand on the dog. If your dog is coming from a busy environment, they're likely to appreciate some quiet time. Plan activities away from other dogs or people to give them that quiet time. Aim for low stress activities because you may not have had time to get to know your dog very well yet. You may also not be aware of all of their likes and dislikes. Keep activities simple for now, and as you get to know your dog's personality, you'll be able to choose more fun things to do, which you know you'll both enjoy. And if you're doing something new with your dog, don't forget to bring treats and toys so you can really show them how awesome it was to spend time together. In addition to those basics, there are some other important things to remember about your first month with your new dog. One of the first things you should do is obtain identification. Your dog is not likely to know how to get back home if they get lost, and dogs who wear some kind of external ID are far more likely to be returned to their families. On that topic, be sure to have your dog on leash when they're outside. They might be startled by something unpredictable, like a bike going by, and it's best to keep them safely attached to you until you have a better idea of how they'll react to new scenarios. Many dogs show signs of digestive upset when they're transitioning to a new home. Even if you have the luxury of transitioning them slowly from the food that they've been eating to a new one, you're likely to see some signs of an upset tummy due to their body coping with all of the other changes. Establish your long-term veterinarian before you need to take your dog into an appointment. Even if you're just calling to transfer their records, this can save you time and confusion if you do have an emergency. Enrichment refers to the variety of ways we can keep our dogs mentally and physically occupied. Often, we target natural behaviors like chasing, chewing, dissecting, sniffing. You can choose low-key activities like licking a Kong with frozen peanut butter or pushing a puzzle toy around to help them feel calm and relaxed while also keeping them busy. It's 
also important to recognize right now that there are some activities which would be better to hold off on. Big events, drastic changes in environment, and lots of introductions to new people and animals can get overwhelming fast. You'll have plenty of time for these things after your dog has settled into their new routine. That's the fun part, right? Looking forward to a lifetime of cool things that you get to do with your dog. So now that we've got the foundation for success in place, we can start looking at some of the nuances in communication and in each dog's individual experience. First, remember that stress is a normal response to change. It is not at all unusual for a dog who is experiencing a big transition to show signs of stress. This even happens when a dog is moving with their same family into a new home. What's important to understand is how that stress can affect the way that your dog feels and the way that they behave. Stress can have two different kinds of effect. There's situational stress, which is related to a specific change or circumstance, and it usually subsides as the dog becomes used to the change or if a particular stressor is removed. We can see this kind of stress in a dog who moves from one healthy environment into another healthy environment. And then there's chronic stress, which lasts longer and which may be related to experiencing inescapable or unpredictable stressors. Long-term kennel residents, uh, dogs who haven't had the best start to life, are at a higher risk for chronic stress. Chronic stress can also have a genetic component, so it's really important to recognize that this is not entirely dependent on the dog's history or their environment. In order to understand how our dogs feel and behave when stressed, we have to take a look at the mechanisms behind it. One of the major components in your dog's physiological stress reaction is a hormone called cortisol. The big things I want you to remember about cortisol are that it's a stress hormone which lasts for a long time in the body and it has an effect on many different functions in the body. You can see the list there. It has an effect on blood sugar, blood pressure, memory, and metabolism. If we recognize that our dogs are not feeling very well physically and that they're not thinking very clearly when they're stressed, we can make better progress towards helping them to feel better and towards addressing their actions in an appropriate way. Also keep in mind that anything which interacts with that many different bodily functions is going to be inherently exhausting. Your dog's body is actually working really hard when it's under stress, and it can only keep that up for so long. Dogs who experience chronic stress or who experience a really extreme situational stressor will often reach the point where they just shut down and they don't have the energy to respond outwardly to that stress they're experiencing, but they are still under stress. These very fearful or nervous dogs can be mistakenly labeled as chill or relaxed, which prevents them from getting the help that they need. The way to tell the difference is to identify whether they're eagerly engaging in a normal range of activity, like play, seeking out affection, social contact, eating normally, they're interested in investigating new things and new locations, uh, versus a dog who's showing a general lack of interest in new things and interactions. Another key way to identify your dog's mental state is through their body language. A dog who is uncomfortable will usually make some effort to communicate that, but because we're people, and we're highly verbal, but we're communicating with dogs who primarily communicate with body language, signals often get crossed. One of the interesting things about body language is that it often serves multiple purposes. Consider the picture on the far left. This is a stressed dog who is panting and turning away from the person she is interacting with. These are body language communication signals. When we know what we're looking at, we can say, oh, you're stressed and you're asking me to back off a bit, which serves her communication purpose. Simultaneously, the dog's own body is saying, oh, I'm stressed, I better increase oxygen intake and try to cool myself down. We also have this really interesting picture on the far right, which is a great example of how communication between two different species can sometimes go wrong. This dog is very, very uncomfortable and is using the clearest signal he can to express that. 
He's rolled onto his side. His legs are held stiffly in the air. His ears are pinned back. His head is pulled back. And he's staring directly at the person he's interacting with. This is the doggy equivalent of shouting, hey, back off. I'm done. It's also a posture which frequently gets confused with a dog asking for belly rubs. If this person were to reach down and start petting this dog, it would only increase the dog's stress and could even cause the dog to escalate to some level of conflict. Here we have a couple more examples of what to look for in a stressed or fearful dog. On the left, there's that heavy panting again. They have low posture, their head is held low, their tail is held low, their eyes are huge. On the right, we have a dog who is laying down, but you can still see how tensely he's holding himself in that stacked sphinx down position. We also see a furrowed brow, dropped ears, and a tightly closed mouth. All of these details together help us to read the dog's internal state. Now that we know how to identify stressed or fearful dogs so that we can better help them, we also get to have fun looking at relaxed body language and thinking about how we can increase the amount of time our dogs spend looking like this. On the left, we see a dog playing with a really fun toy called a flirt lure. This picture shows a really interesting moment for us where we can identify a tightly closed mouth and tense muscles but context and other body language clues tell us that there is nothing to worry about. She's holding that play about posture with her butt up and elbows down. Her ears are perked in forward. And we can see in this case that she's tracking that toy in preparation for a good pounce. The photo on the right also shows a dog who's feeling comfortable, but whose body language needs to be read completely and in context. If you only look at the fact that this dog is panting, you may believe that they're stressed. But in this case, we're looking at a dog who is anticipating something positive. Uh, I believe in this case, she's waiting for a ball to be thrown. You can see that she's leaning slightly forward. Her ears are perked in forward. Her tail is wagging back and forth at a neutral height. She is enjoying herself. Next, we have a couple of dogs who are also enjoying themselves, but are more calm rather than communicating playfulness. On the left, you can observe perked ears, soft, relaxed eyes. Her tail is held in its natural position, which in this case is curled upward. Her mouth is loosely open and her posture is neutral, meaning she's not making any effort to lean either forward or backward. On the right, we see a dog happily engaging in social contact. He's leaning slightly in towards the hand scratching his cheek. His mouth is loosely open. His ears are drifting to the side gently rather than being pinned down. And his eyes are closing a bit as he enjoys those scratches. Knowing that it's normal for dogs to experience stress during a big transition and knowing how to identify stress now leaves us with the task of reducing that stress and making this transition as comfortable as possible. We're going to talk about a number of ways to do this, starting with having patience. Everything your dog is experiencing right now is brand new, including you. There is no way for your dog to know what your expectations are and no way for you to know exactly what your dog is thinking. It's going to take some time for both of you to adapt and learn about each other. But in the meantime, encourage yourself to feel okay with whatever pace things are moving at. In general, we feel safest and most comfortable around people who have a history of being kind to us. You can help your dog to learn that you are trustworthy by choosing to interact with them in a way that is low pressure, encourages cooperation, and feels good for both of you. Try to be the source of lots of good things in their life, from fun games to tasty snacks. In addition to that, try to address frustrating scenarios in the same way that you would want someone to teach you something new. Remember, that's all we're really doing. We're teaching our dogs how to navigate a whole new world. As your dog encounters all of these new things, we want to promote their sense of optimism by helping them to record those experiences as good ones. Whether your dog is interacting with you, other family members, or other animals in the house, the key ways you can ensure that they have a positive interaction are to do your best to read what they're communicating and be willing to make changes if necessary. For example, maybe you buy your new dog a toy um, but they're afraid of the squeaker, so you play with something else for now. 
and over time you can get to know their preferences. Which leads us to thinking about choice. Animals who have the freedom to make choices are generally better off than animals who don't. This is the same for humans. That hunk you see in the photo is Bennington. He's in long-term care with Canine Turbo while he waits for his forever home. And a very important part of keeping Benny happy is giving him the opportunity to make choices throughout his day. In this one moment, you can actually identify a number of choices that he has open to him. At the time of this picture, Benny had decided that he would like to enjoy that Kong. He could also decide to go interact with the person if he preferred social time. He could jump up onto the couch to take a nap. He has the freedom to select other toys if he would prefer to chew instead of lick. These may seem like small differences to us, but think about all of the choices you make throughout the course of a normal day, which your dog may never get to make. What you'll eat, who you'll interact with, where you'll go. When you have no control over large portions of your time, the ability to make small choices can make a huge difference to quality of life. Remember when we talked about enrichment? This is another great way to reduce stress. The more we get our dogs constructively using their senses, exercising, and enjoying themselves, the more effectively they can decompress. Lastly, we can give our dogs some sense of predictability. Routines can be comforting and even make your dog's world feel a little bit safer. Even the simple things like knowing when to expect meals, when you might leave and return home, or when it's time to go to bed can create a sense of normalcy following such a big transition. This is my favorite part of adopting a new dog. Personally, I think the best part about bringing a new dog home is getting to see them develop a bond with you. You can help the process along by keeping the following things in mind. Consider their perspective. I've said this a few times, but I really believe that it's essential to helping your dog adapt Everything is brand new for your dog. By looking at this transition from your dog's perspective, you can start working towards effective communication and problem solving. Is your dog going to the bathroom in their crate? Maybe this was the only option they had previously. They might not even know that they could go potty outside. Make a plan. It's easier to make progress when you know where you're going. Think of all the things you want your dog to do and begin setting small goals to help get them started. If you want your dog to wait patiently for food, you might start by putting their bowl down at the moment that all four paws are on the floor. You can also think about the behaviors that you would like to prevent your dog from doing and put management in place to make those behaviors very unlikely. If you want your dog to ignore items on the counters, start with completely empty, boring counters. Teach your dog with compassion. Every interaction is teaching you both a little bit more about each other. If you break tasks down into manageable steps, patiently explain each step, and reward your dog's progress, they are going to love learning from you. And give yourself a break. By adopting a dog, you've most likely created a cascade of changes in your own life. As rewarding as it is, remember to both go easy on yourself mentally if things aren't happening the way you expected them to, and to actually give yourself breaks to relax and enjoy the things you normally like to do. When you feel refreshed, you're going to be better able to help your dog. We hear all the time about how healthy relationships require good communication, and it's true of our relationships with our dogs. As you're learning more about your dog's body language, it's important to be able to identify good sources of information so that you can continue to advance your knowledge. A few guidelines to keep in mind are, can you clearly identify who the information is coming from? What are the credentials of your source? Uh, organizations like the American Veterinary Society of Animal Behavior have compiled great articles written by board certified veterinary behaviorists and consider the age of your resource. It's best to refer to information published within the last 10 years. I actually chose this photo for the slide because it made me cringe so much when I saw it. Now that we've reviewed some body language, can you see the signs that this dog is massively uncomfortable? Can you think of some reasons why that might be? The dog is in a strange new environment, the photo studio in this case, with an unfamiliar person. That model is probably not mom. And she has no ability to make choices about what's happening to her. As a result, we have a dog who is leaning away from the person 
actually stretching her neck out and away as far as she can. With a furrowed brow, pinned ears, and a tightly closed mouth, she's frequently blinking her eyes, and her tail is low. She is not happy. One way you can prevent your best buddy from looking like that Dalmatian is by using consent for touch. Offer your hands out to your dog and wait for them to choose if they would like to move in to make contact. If they do, pet for about five seconds and then stop. If they nuzzle you or move in again, they're asking for petting to continue. If not, they might be in the mood to do something different and we can choose another fun game like fetch or tugs instead. In addition to asking your dog about petting preferences, you can actually teach them to tell you when they need to go potty, if they're hungry versus wanting to go outside, if they'd rather chase the ball or go for a walk. Training these communication behaviors can make it so much easier to understand your dog, not to mention it looks really impressive when you show your friends how you and your dog can talk to each other. Many of your households include children or may have children visiting, and there are so many fun ways that we can help our new dogs to see children as fun companions. When making decisions about how to move forward with introducing dogs and kids, try to set realistic expectations for both of them. A two-year-old child is going to have a much different capacity for controlling their movement and comprehending safety than an eight-year-old child. A dog who has never seen a child before may need additional time to get used to the tiny, fast-moving humans. In any situation where you're introducing dogs and kids, proactive management and prevention are key. Install baby gates so that dogs and children do not have unlimited access to each other. If your child is really interested in seeing the dog in their crate, you may have to add a small lock to the door. For older children, it may be difficult to remember that having a dog has changed their routine. Posting visible reminders about closing doors and where to put vulnerable items like shoes and backpacks can just help things to keep running smoothly. It's not fun for anyone to follow kids around telling them all the things they can't do with the dog. You can make the process feel better while also keeping everyone safe by focusing on everything they can do right with the dog. It's often helpful to explain things to children in a way that they can relate to by saying things like, it makes you sad when your sister steals your toys, and it makes our dog sad too when you steal his toys. You can help them to understand why they need to behave safely around the dog. There are lots of fun, safe activities that children can enjoy with dogs. Fetch is great for small children who don't have a lot of coordination. If your dog gets really excited by chasing the toy, you can have the child throw it over a baby gate with the dog on the other side. And the supervising adult in that scenario will be the one to pick up the ball and return it to the child. Kids can also set up scavenger hunts. If they're nervous about the new dog, this is a perfect way to get them involved without feeling like they have to interact directly. Just let them choose a few places to hide treats and then let the dog go search for them. If your child doesn't have a lot of experience with handling animals gently, they can practice on a stuffed animal before interacting with the new dog. Skills like petting softly with a flat hand, where to pet, and how to hold their hand to give a treat can all be practiced with a stuffed animal. For those of you who already have pets in your home, there are a few things you can do to ensure that those introductions go smoothly as well. Start by assuming that both the current animals and the new dog will be uncomfortable until they prove they have the skills to navigate the changes. Strive to keep your current pet's routine consistent. This will help to decrease their own stress. It's often useful to crate or confine the new dog for periods of time so that current pets can take a break and have a sense of normalcy and the new dog can get some peace and quiet to decompress. This also helps to prevent them from competing for your time and attention. Keep interactions short for now. The less time your dog and your current pets have to get irritated with each other, the more they'll look forward to seeing each other the next time. And end interactions on a good note. If you're watching your new dog interact with your current pets and you think, wow, this is going so well, that is the perfect time to give them a break. Again, if they enjoyed the interaction last time, they'll look forward to it more the next time. There's a lot of new information to take in when you've adopted a dog. And it can be overwhelming to sift through information as you try to answer specific questions. So we've included a few of the most common ones. The first is, how do I teach my dog to love the crate? Think about the size of the crate. 
Can your dog comfortably stretch out and engage in a normal range of activity with safe toys or change positions? Start with very short periods of time in the crate and gradually increase the duration if your dog is doing well. Make the crate a place where really cool things happen. This is a great place for your dog to enjoy their enrichment puzzles. Try to practice going in the crate while you're home. This way you can identify any trouble your dog may have and you can let them out before they become anxious and they can get a little bit more used to it. In some situations, it may be beneficial to skip the crate. If your dog struggles with confinement, they may actually be more upset and disruptive inside the crate than they would be if they were outside of it. Test this when you don't actually have to go anywhere and put away anything the dog may have access to which is dangerous, valuable, or sentimental. How do I potty train my new dog? While you're monitoring and building a routine, it can be helpful to actually write down your dog's accidents and successes. Include the day, time, location, whether it was the number one or number two or both. You can more easily identify patterns and trouble spots this way. Some likely times your dog will have to go potty include following activity, shortly after eating or drinking, after confinement, and any time they wake up, including naps. There are a number of methods people use to teach their dog to ask to go outside. Uh, one of the most common is a bell on the door, and it tends to be one of the easiest to teach. Make sure you go outside with your dog. If you didn't see it, you can't say it happened, and you can't reinforce it. Your dog may have no idea that they were supposed to go potty while they're outside and have an accident as soon as they come back in. It's super important to keep pos potty training positive. Reward with the best stuff you can think of and keep in mind that punishment will have unwanted effects on your dog's behavior. It can break down their trust in you, it can teach them to hide when they have to go to the bathroom, and it can make it much more difficult to reinforce them for going in the correct place because they're too afraid to go in front of you. These are a few of the signs that your dog is probably feeling the urge to go. Sniffing around, inability to focus or settle, looking for exits, sudden hyperactivity, whining or barking, and circling can all be indications that your dog needs to go potty. Our next question is, how do I prevent anxiety when I leave? You can identify your dog's preferences for comfort and be sure they have access to their most preferred setup when you're gone. If your dog likes to snuggle down in lots of pillows and blankets, be sure they have them available in their crate or in the room that they're spending time in. Maybe you have a dog who overheats easily, a simple supportive mat might be more comfortable for them. When you're going to disappear, give your dog something else great to look forward to. Kongs are safe for most dogs to enjoy while alone, and you can stuff them with an ever-changing variety of fillings to keep them exciting. If your dog must be confined, remember to train for it in advance. And if your dog is showing severe symptoms of panic or distress, do not hesitate to talk to your veterinarian. It's so much better to take action quickly than to see those symptoms continuing to escalate. What to do about behavior changes? It's not at all uncommon for recent adopters to see their dog's behavior change as they spend more time in their new home. As they become comfortable, they're more likely to explore and experiment. Um, really nervous dogs might start to gain confidence and express themselves more. And for some dogs, small annoyances may build up over time until your dog feels the need to now react to them. Often, when we decrease management too quickly, we see behaviors which feel like the dog has changed, but in truth, they're just being faced with a situation that's too challenging for them at this point in time. If you're starting to see requests for space, or if your dog is starting to tell you that they're bored, just be sure to listen to them. We're the ones who are most capable of changing their environment to better set them up for success. In addition to good management, training can help you to find long-term solutions for any undesirable behaviors which do begin to pop up. Lastly, how do I help my dog with fear of new people, places, or objects? It's possible that your dog has a negative history with the things that they're showing fear towards, and those past experiences can have a dramatic effect upon how the dog feels now, even though their environment has changed. However, it's also entirely possible that your dog has no history with that particular thing. And it's simply the fact that the thing is new, which makes it frightening. In situations where your dog is showing fear, our goal is to change the underlying emotion from negative to positive. We do this through classical counter conditioning and desensitization. 
Counter conditioning means that every time something happens that your dog doesn't like, we follow it up with something awesome that they do like. For example, if your dog hates the sound of the doorbell, we would first present the doorbell sound and then immediately follow it with your dog's favorite treat. We would repeat that every single time the dog hears the doorbell until the doorbell causes your dog to think about yummy treats instead of feeling afraid. An absolutely essential part of counter conditioning correctly is pairing it with desensitization. This means that we find ways to make the trigger easier to deal with during training. With our doorbell example, instead of a stranger ringing the doorbell, which is the scenario that would be most upsetting to your dog, you might record your doorbell and play it at a very low volume when you're pairing it with the treats. As your dog shows success at the low volume, you then gradually increase the volume to become more reflective of your real life scenario. It's also super helpful to train accessory skills, which can help your dog navigate a frightening scenario. U-turns, recalls, and retreating to a safe space are all cues which we can teach to avoid escalation when your dog is afraid. Let's actually think back a moment to that last slide. As your dog gains confidence, you're likely to see behavior changes. In a fearful dog, this may mean that instead of freezing in place, your dog now barks at whatever is scaring them. It's still the same fear they felt before, but that little increase in confidence allows them to express themselves more actively. Now that you have a plan for the beginning stages of your dog's new life with you, you can also begin to think about long-term goals. Consider what kind of training makes the most sense to help you reach those goals, whether it's a group class to build the foundations of your dog's behavior or an in-home appointment to target a specific need. You can continue to take advantage of upcoming seminars and webinars, and you can read the articles on our blog, which address a variety of dog guardian questions. And those listed books are particularly good sources for learning more about your new furry friend. But above all else, enjoy the process. These early days go so fast. Try to give yourselves opportunities to soak it all in and just enjoy your new best friend. Thank you so much for attending our webinar and for doing all that you can to help the dogs in your care. Once again, congratulations.